Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, salam sejahtera, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, salam kebajikan bagi kita semua. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you here. Distinguished Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Peri Warjio, Minister of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Minister of Women Empowerment and Child Protection, Ibu I Gusti Ayu Bintang Darmawati, Deputy Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Dodi Budi Waluyo, Head of Fiscal Policy Agency, Bapak Febrio Nathan Kacaribu, Co-Chair of the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, Ms. Magda Bianco from Bank of Italy, Head of SME's Development and Consumer Protection Department of Bank Indonesia, Ibu Yunita Resmisari, Head of Center of Financial Sector Policy of Indonesia Ministry of Finance, Bapak Adi Budiarso, Panelists from Saudi Central Bank, German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, Islamic Development Bank, International Fund for Agricultural Development, Women's World Banking, Middle East Investment Initiatives, Government Investment Center, Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia, Owner of Indonesian Small Businesses, Head of Departments and Representatives, Offices of Bank Indonesia, Head of Regional Offices of Ministry of Finance of Indonesia, representatives from ministries and institutions, participants, invitees, stakeholders, strategic partners, ladies and gentlemen. We are happy to have you here in the G20 International Seminar on Digital Transformation for Financial Inclusion of Women, Youth and MSMEs to Promote Inclusive Growth. These International Seminar aims to share best practices and also showcasing of policies, programs, as well as financial products and services to accelerate financial inclusion of women, youth, MSMEs, and social benefit recipients, taking advantage of the development of digital and innovative approaches and considering the COVID-19 recovery. My name is Timothy Marbun and it is my honor to welcome all of you to the official side event of the G20 Indonesia Presidency 2022 with the theme, Recover Together, Recover Stronger. Now this event will be followed by the second Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion or GPFI meeting on the 12th and 13th of May, 2022. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Today's event will commence with welcoming remarks from the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia. Without further ado, I would like to honorably invite Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati to deliver her speech. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. Excellency, Bank Indonesia Governor, Bapak Peri Warjio, Her Excellency, Ibu Menteri uh, Pemberdayaan Perempuan and Child Protection, Ibu I Gusti Ayu Bintang Darmawati, Honorable GPFI Co-Chairs and Member Countries Delegate, Honorable Speakers and Moderators, Honorable Participants, Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you in this part of the world. Good afternoon or even good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May health and prosperity be upon us all. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. We are gathering today in, in this G20 site event, International Seminar, with the topic Digital Transformation for Financial Inclusion of Women, Youth, and MSMEs to Promote Inclusive Growth. For those of you who attend this event physically, welcome to Bali. And I do hope that you are enjoying your stay and will be able to come back again in the future. We know that according to the latest World Bank Global Financial Index database, this is back in 2017, 69% of adults around the world already have an account at the financial institution or through a mobile 
money provider. This is slightly increased in, from 2014, which is the level is 62%. While this is a progress, a good progress, but it also shows that around 30% of the global population or approximately 1.7 billion people are still lack of access to financial product and services. Among these people are the hard to reach segment such as women, youth, and also micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSMEs. The recent financial inclusion insight survey by the Indonesia National Council for Financial Inclusion, or Dewan Nasional Keuangan Inclusive, also show a similar trend in Indonesia, in which 62% of adults holding an account in 2020. During this COVID pandemic, many micro and small medium enterprises have suffered which in, in the form of closing their businesses, in which one in five women let business close. A lot of women and youth have lost their income and become more vulnerable. In addition, social benefit recipients have also fallen deeper into poverty. As the pandemic takes away job and worsen poverty, it also complicates our effort to address barrier to financial inclusion. So focusing on financially excluded segment is urgent since they are at least likely to have quality affordable healthcare and adequate saving or access to credit that can help them to weather the economic downturn. We understand that micro and small medium enterprises play a very critical role in job creation, in investment, and also in the economic development. In Indonesia, for example, the role of MSMEs is very significant. They are providing 97% of our employment, more than 60% of our GDP, and more than 60% of our investment. While they play a very critical role, the development of MSMEs are still facing with many obstacles, including the most important is their access to finance. Currently, if we look at the Indonesia, only 18% of the total bank credit has been channeled or giving to the small and medium enterprises. This is far below the peer average of 30 to 80%. Also, during this COVID-19 pandemic, which hit hard MSME more, they are creating even more vulnerable situation. So our focus today and how we are going to be able to implement policy to increase access to finance for micro, small, and medium enterprises, which is very critical to not only empower them, but also in creating a powerful multiplier effect in the form of employment and economic growth to recover our economy due to the very hard hit from the pandemic. We also have to pay attention on the women because women plays an important role in the economic development. Enhancing women's 
clients access to formal financial services will not only secure women family life, but also empower themselves by engaging in business activity such as MSMEs. We are all maybe recognize or recall the McKinsey Global Institute study, which is showing that 12 trillion US dollar or 11% of global GDP could be created if all countries advance women equality. If we even could realize the potential of women, especially in the economy and labor market, we can potentially create 28 trillion US dollar economic activity, or this is equal to 26% of the world GDP by 2025. But while on the one hand, we recognize this huge potential, especially in empowering women, women are often excluded from financial services because they don't have any identity card or they cannot hold asset under their name. So this create a very severe constraint for them to access financial uh, as well as capital from financial institution because they don't have collateral. Now we talk about youth. Youth is, a, in this case, is 16% of our global population actually in this segment as a youth. They definitely is a very important segment of the population because they hold the key to the future. They will soon enter the workforce and contribute to the economy. But many of you remain financially excluded because they lack of legal, uh, lack of official identity documentation, or they also still need approval from their legal guardian to open bank account. Or even the constraint is in the form of stereotyping in which use is associated with higher risk linked to irregular income flows and small deposit and saving. As a consequence, the use often, in this case, being ignored as potential customers and they don't have access financial product are developed to address their specific circumstances or needs. Therefore, the need to build inclusive financial and inclusive economy, we have to address these two very important or three very important dimension, women, youth, and micro, small, and medium enterprises how we are going to include them, that they are going to have an access of financial services. Access to a transaction account is the first step toward broader financial inclusion. The work is already in progress, but we also recognize that this is still need a lot of work ahead of us. Fortunately, the advancement of information and technology has supported our effort to achieve financial inclusion target. Digitalization, artificial intelligence, and big data analysis are just small part of what has been utilized around the world to especially foster the progress on the financial inclusion, particularly to this segment, women, youth, and MSME. The digital financial inclusion is also one of the focus of our Indonesia G20 presidency, 
especially this is taking place and has been done through the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion or GPFI. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased also the complication of the recovery process. At this very moment, the world in a very fragile recovery process and now adding to this challenge, the increasing commodity prices, as well as geopolitical situation as creating even more challenge for our recovery process. As you can see, Indonesia G20 presidency theme is how we are going to be able to recover together and recover stronger. So our effort need to be even double or triple. A transformation toward digital technology need to continue to make sure that the population, especially the most vulnerable one and undeserved group that still need to be able to get the financial services need to be promoted. This is not only morally right, this is going to be also strategically important for the inclusive economic recovery. This event today is the second GPFI plenary meetings, which will be held tomorrow and the day after. Today's international seminar will focus on two important topics. The first one is exploring the opportunity and challenges of as well as the policies and program to promote digital financial inclusion, especially for women, youth, and micro, small, medium enterprises. The second is going to discuss how we can utilize financial inclusion to target those segments to promote broader economic inclusion. At this event, we have speakers from various countries and also from international organizations. They will share with us their experiences and expertise in digital financial inclusion. As we know, financial inclusion become an entry point that opens the chance for the economic inclusion. When all people have access and can participate in the economy, it will definitely lead to globally sustainable and better quality inclusive growth. Through digitalization, financial inclusion could increase economic productivity and also inclusiveness, sustainability, and especially in providing more equality because it addresses the issue, those segments which is typically and generally lag behind, that is small medium enterprises, women and youth. For small medium enterprises, we can improve financial inclusion by harnessing digitalization through financial technology or fintech. Fintech support MSMEs by helping them find more efficient financing options. And even they can help us in implementing health protocols during the COVID-19 pandemic. Fintech also can provide a more public to make transactions more efficient, more transparent, buy, sell, consume with minimum contact. This is especially very useful during the pandemic. We also can use QR code payment. As of for women, the major challenges from harnessing digitalization come from lower digital, digital literacy skills and also low financial literacy, especially women who tend to enter in the informal sector. You cannot just open an account for a woman 
and expect immediately that they will then use this account actively. Without financial literacy and education, it will be difficult to open an account, then also link it to provide with another implication or other positive benefit that could actually enjoy by them. This is especially true for Indonesia when we, in this case, design many of social support by name, by address, by account number, in which we can then provide financial account to many women. But after opening account, these women are just actually using in a very minimum or passive way. They are not yet using this account for any other transaction. Women entrepreneurs with a good level of financial literacy can better manage their personal or household finance and reap the benefit of financial products to develop their businesses and also to build financial secure, financially secure future according to their need. And that's why the program to provide financial literacy and education is very critical for this segment. On youth, which is commonly revered as a digital native since they have more probability in accessing to the personal digital devices earlier in their life and also as an early adopter of financial product, they may be amongst the key beneficiary of the digitalization of financial services. The FinTech Adoption Index highlighted that young people are the driving force overall for the FinTech adoption by increasing access to formal financial services for them, they can invest in their education to improve their employability and future professional perspective. It has also enabled them to gain their autonomy in society. For example, accessing to housing and also planning their future. The youth can also become active in socioeconomic actors in their country. In addition to accessing financial services and products that will give young people the opportunity to launch their entrepreneurship initiative, they can also even have an important contribution in creating job. Whilst leveraging on fintech can boost access to finance, it is also equally important to supervise these sectors and have adequate consumer protection measure, including data. This is definitely not an easy task, given the fact that especially in the city area, Digital financial services are actually expanded very rapidly with the ownership of the smartphone. Many financial services over their financial access, but then they become a problem for many people who borrowing money with such an excessive and high interest rate. In Indonesia, we call them pinjol that is borrowing from online or pinjaman online, in which then the people who borrow cannot afford the, to repay them. Technology is changing the financial system for sure. That's why for the policymaker and also regulator, we need to ensure that this change is safe and providing benefit in the form of inclusion, but at the same time, it's also protect the people, privacy, and especially protect those which is vulnerable from the abusive practice due to this technology. I believe this event will surely be beneficial for all of us and our strategy in achieving the target of financial inclusion 
and also in promoting access to responsible financial services to the most vulnerable and undeserved group. I do hope that the discussion will not only end here, but we can continue in other events as well as in our respective countries and institution. Before closing, I would like to convey my appreciation to all speakers, moderators, and participants for attending this event, especially physically, but also virtually. Last but not least, I would like to express for the GPFI member countries delegate, I wish you a successful deliberation in the plenary meeting. Uh, thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi 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 Om. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu Sri Mulyani, for delivering your remarks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to honorably invite the Governor of Bank Indonesia, Bapak Peri Warjio, to deliver his keynote speech. Bapak Peri Warjio, the time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, greeting to everyone. Your Excellency, Minister of Finance, Republic of Indonesia, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Ibu, Igusti Ayu Bintang Darmawati as a guest lecturer. Magda Bianco, GPFI co-chair, Bank of Italy. Distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen. More than two years, we are living with the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we already felt as a very extraordinary and substantial impact to the world economy and to everyday living. Not only causing health issues, but also economic crisis, resulting in increasing unemployment and poverty. Referring to a numerous surveys, we should have a fit on MSLE and Indonesia and also through in many other countries. MSME has the ability to adapt to the pandemic, to the challenges, and as well as also benefit from digital innovation including the use of e-commerce and digital financial services. Digital platform is effective in helping MSMEs to recover their business. Digitalization in addition to increasing market access, but also improve financial inclusion, particularly through the use of digital finance. Distinguished ladies, and gentlemen. Bank Indonesia consistently implement MSME's development initiative based on the three policy pillars, which is corporatization, capacity development, and access of facility to financing. Beyond that, Bank Indonesia also encourage and promote MSSE through a comprehensive and inclusive digital transformation, carried out along the value chain to support the creation of an integrated digital ecosystem. The MSM is Digitization Initiative aims to boost productivity and efficiency, expand MSME market access on a national and global scale, and make financing easier for MSSE. Our strategy addressing both the demand as well as the supply side. From the demand side, we increase the capacity and competitiveness of MSME and encourage 
the greater use of digitalization through MSME business processes. From the supply side, we prepare the infrastructure to facilitate MSME in their digital transformation. Moreover, wide, wider adoption of QR innovation standard continue to be encouraged to facilitate MSME's digital transformation. Increasing use of QR innovation standard has facilitated and serve as a gateway to the digital economy and financial ecosystem. Through QR innovation standard, the digitization of MSMEs can be accelerated to support an inclusive economy and finance. Our data as March 18, 2022, so that of the 16.1 million registered QR innovation merchants, 89, 89% of them are MSMEs. This is ladies and gentlemen. Of course, the road to promote MSME as well as digital transformation is not always easy. We know a number of challenges we see that. For example, lack economic ability, financial and digital literacy, and limited access to digital technologies and infrastructure. Therefore, our program, Bank Indonesia Financial Inclusion Program for Vulnerable and Underserved Population, integrates economic activity and financial inclusion program include, which is encompass the following three important steps. The first, economic empowerment. We direct our economic empowerment at women who are keen to pursue, to pursue their dreams in establishing micro enterprises and forming group. Number two, capacity development. Capacity development effort are concentrated and en enhancing productivity through innovation and digitalization of business processes in order to boost the competitiveness of MSME. Bank Indonesia also support education program aimed at enhancing MSME's financial management capacity, financial literacy, and consumer protection. Number three, policy harmonization. Bank Indonesia support the harmonization of government policy in MSMEs through the implementation of job creation law through simplification of licensing processes. The law encourages the MSME ecosystem development and e-commerce support for MSME access to global and domestic marketing, including licensing, digital infrastructure, electronic transaction. Distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen. In closing, digitalization is a game changer in our effort to recover from pandemic from the challenges to build more inclusivity in our economic and finance. With accelerated digitalization, it is critical to be able to strike a balance between innovation to promote digital financial inclusion and managing emerging risks. Policymakers need to ensure that the risks are mitigated. We hope that this international seminar will allow us to discuss policy ideas and best practices for promoting digital transformation in order to improve financial and economic inclusion of MSMEs, women, and youth. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Bapak Peri Wargio, the Governor of Bank Indonesia, for delivering his keynote speech. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen together the opening of the International Seminar on Digital Transformation for Financial Inclusion of Women, Youth, and MSMEs to promote inclusive growth. And once again, please allow 
to express our sincere gratitude to Ibu Sri Mulyani and also Bapak Peri Warjio who have joined us in this auspicious moment. We will now continue to our next agenda, the panel discussion of International Seminar on Digital Transformation for Financial Inclusion of Women, Youth, MSMEs to Promote Inclusive Growth with the first topic, Access for All, Building Inclusive Finance for Women, Youth, MSMEs, and Social Benefit Recipients. And our second topic later on is Unlocking Financial Inclusion as the Pathway Towards Economic Inclusion. Now, before we proceed to the first topic of the panel discussion today, I would like to invite Minister of Women Empowerment and Child Protection as the guest lecturer for our first panel discussion. Ibu I Gusti Ayu Bintang Dharmawati. The screen is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Nama Budaya, Salam Kebajikan. Honorables, Ibu Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Minister of Finance Republic of Indonesia, Bapak Perry Warjio, Indonesian Central Bank Governor, Honorable Speakers and Participants. It's an honor for us at the Indonesia Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection to join this very important international seminar on digital transformation for financial inclusion of women, youth, and MSMEs to promote inclusive growth. This year's G20 Presidency of Indonesia give opportunities and strategies to address issues at home and among G20 member countries. The Government of Indonesia will collaborate with the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion to prioritize women financial inclusion in global conversation about inclusive growth. We are certain that this is timely and important in light of the challenges that G20 countries and the rest of the globe are facing today. As the world attitude about this topic said rightly, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we are currently facing an unprecedented worldwide crisis, especially economic issues sparked by the COVID-19 pandemic. Women are bearing the brunt of COVID-19 economic crisis. Countries, women across the globe are severely infected, including loss of income, increased unfair care work and double burden. Women in Indonesia are more likely than men to lose their jobs. Women also make up the majority of workers in the services sector, which has been hit hard by restrictions. While the crisis has highlighted the importance of flexible work arrangements, it has also invited the double burden that women face in balancing family and work responsibilities. Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous country with a population of more than 270 million people with half of them being women. Unfortunately, women labor force participation rate is still for behind men. Therefore, unlocking the economic potential of women and women's micro and small businesses is critical to strong national economy recovery. According to current data, there are approximately 65.4 million micro, small, and medium enterprises in Indonesia with approximately half of them managed and owned by women. This data demonstrates the enormous potential resources of women to serve as a driving force not only in achieving economic recovery from the pandemic, but also as the foundation of our long-term economic stability. Excellency, 
Ladies and gentlemen, as the world transition to our digital economy, doing business over the internet is unavoidable. We recognize that the internet provides an opportunity to grow our business. Data shows that 54% of our women-owned micro-businesses use the internet compares the 39% of men. The research also states that women are more likely to take the proactive step of diversifying their product offering and expand into new sector, location, or product. Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go in terms of women financial inclusion women financial inclusion or access to financial product and services is still lower than men's. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, in the middle of the pandemic, the Indonesia government is paying close attention to the existence of women MSMEs, not only to survive but also to grow and become even stronger. Gender Perspective Entrepreneurship Training is one of Indonesia's leading strategies for achieving economic empowerment for women. We also establish women and child-friendly villages to accelerate the implementation of women empowerment and child protection at the village, district, and provincial levels. Creating women entrepreneurship and financial inclusion is one of the goals of this program. In addition to financial and digital literacy, the general aspect of financial inclusion, such as equal access and asset ownership rights, is critical in ensuring women access to financial products ranging from basic saving, capital, and lending for SMEs to insurance and investment. The Indonesian government announced the national strategy for women financial inclusion. The ASEAN Development Bank recognizes this strategy as the first and only one of its kind in the world. Presidential Regulation No. 2, Year 2022 on National Entrepreneurship Development was also recently issued by the government. This regulation aims to significantly increase the number of entrepreneurs as well as to ensure various facilities are available to support the businesses. We also issued several regulations to support women MSMEs not only to grow but also to save their businesses from informal to formal. For underprivileged women, with the spirit of property eradication, we also created the MECAR program, a financing plan for women micro and ultra micro enterprises. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, as the host of the G20 presidency, we've come to ensure that women are actively involved in global economic recovery plans and action. We have gathered here today to guarantee that diversity is a crucial component of our inclusive, sustainable development. When women are empowered, children are well protected, prosperity will be available for us all. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Santi 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 Om Namo Buddhaya. Thank you very much, Ibu Igusti Ayu Bintang Darmawati, the guest lecturer for our first panel discussion tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now commence our first panel discussion. 
We invite you to also participate in the discussion in person or online by submitting your questions, which will later be answered by the panelists in the Q&A session. Now, for those joining us online, you may submit your question through the chat box by stating your name, your institution, to whom the question is addressed to, followed by your question. Now, for those present here at the venue, you may raise your hand during the Q&A session, and we will inform the moderator, and the moderator will give you time to deliver your question. Please also do state your name, your institution, and to whom the question is addressed to. Now, our moderator for this first panel discussion is a financial sector specialist from the Asian Development Bank. She has been involved in ADB's financial inclusion interventions in the Southeast Asia region and currently is the financial inclusion lead for Indonesia. Ms. Purnima Jayawardana holds a master's degree of science in international development from the University of Manchester in the UK and BBA, MBA, and PhD degrees from the Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University in Japan. She has also received professional executive education on financial inclusion and financial technology from Harvard University, the United States, Oxford University, and Cambridge University in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Purnima Jayawardana to lead the panel discussion in our first topic today. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Now, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to this panel session on building inclusive finance for women, youth MSMEs, and social benefit recipients as part of the G20 International Seminar on Digital Transformation for Financial Inclusion to promote inclusive growth. We are having a very interesting panel to discuss on this topic today. So before we start the discussion, let me introduce our panelists. Today, we are very happy to have with us Mr. Haitham Al Gulaiga. He's a senior advisor to the Deputy Governor for Research and International Affairs at the Saudi Central Bank. Haitham has over 17 years of experience in the financial sector and has held multiple positions at Saudi Central Bank. He was a senior policy lead for the G20 Saudi Finance Track during the Saudi G20 presidency. He is a member of the Financial Inclusion Task Force of the Arab Monetary Fund and a co-chair of the Financial Inclusion Working Group at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Thank you for joining us today, Haitham. We also have with us Mr. Andy Mullah. He's the Executive Vice President for Global Advocacy and Influence from the Women's World Banking. And he has more than 25 years of experience in global corporate affairs and leadership roles working in international markets across Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Thank you for joining us today, Andy. Also with us today, Mr. Richard Finke. He's the Vice President for the Middle East Investment Initiative. Richard is an experienced private sector development professional who has worked with banks, MFIs, SMEs and large companies across Middle East, North Africa, Southeast Asia, the US and Europe. Currently, he is overseeing the implementation of a credit guarantee facility to support SMEs as well as fintech solution, Townville. Thank you for joining us today, Richard. So finally, also with us today on the panel, Baba Kumar Sukarsana. He's the founder of Bali Arabica, the only Arabica coffee production business in Bali. Thank you for being with us today, Baba Kumar. So please welcome our speakers today. So before we start the discussion, uh, I would also appreciate active participation from the audience. And for those who are joining virtually, feel free to leave your comments and questions through the chat box, and we'll get back to them during the Q&A session. 
So without further ado, let's start with a short three, four minutes interactive presentations or remarks from our panel. First, I would like to request Andy to share introduction to the Women's World Banking and its work around women's entrepreneurship and the Women's Digital Financial Inclusion Global Hub and support for Indonesia. Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Purnim, and uh, good evening to those in the room and uh, good day to everyone else, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Andy Warno. I'm the Executive Vice President for um, Global Advocacy at Women's World Banking. By way of opening remarks, I wanted to introduce our organisation to those who may not know us and, and briefly describe three examples of our work here in Indonesia as it relates to today's topic. Uh, Women's World Banking is a more than 40-year-old non-profit dedicated to women's societal and economic empowerment and prosperity. We believe that every woman and girl should have equal opportunity to participate in, contribute to and benefit from economic and societal growth and to do that with security and dignity. To achieve that, we work to financially include the more than 1 billion women who remain outside of the formal financial system today. We've been active in Indonesia with the support of our funding partners, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Australia's DFAT since around 19, uh, 2014, working with leaders across uh, the Indonesian government, such as the Ministry of Finance, uh, the Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection. We also work with the financial sector with partners like Bank BRI, the Better Than Cash Alliance and the World Bank to support both the access and most importantly usage of financial services for more women. We've been an active partner across the last three G20 presidencies and welcome the opportunity to play an active role in supporting Indonesia's presidency. And I welcome um, Haitam who, who, with whom we worked with under the uh, Saudi Arabian presidency as well. It's good to see him. Um, I'd like to thank all those partners again for their support and also thank the government of Indonesia and the G20 presidency for having us here today. In relation to today's topic, which is financial inclusion for women, youth and MSMEs and social benefit recipients, I wanted to give three quick examples of our work here. Um, many may know us as a, a, an NGO. We're also uh, an impact investor. And um, we have uh, Women's World Banking Asset Management uh, manages a $103 million fund that invests in financial institutions to encourage them to focus on women as customers, but also uh, looking at women throughout their organization to see if we can get more women into leadership positions in those financial institutions. One recent investment we made was in an Indonesian company called Amartha, which is a peer-to-peer -peer financial service provider focused on microcredit towards rural underserved populations. The company connects low-income borrowers to P2P lenders through a digital marketplace platform. Now, given Indonesia's scattered island geography, and as we've heard, it's standing as one uh, the fourth most populous country in the world, this model is an effective way to channel capital from dense urban clusters to highly dispersed rural areas. The off-balance sheet nature of its funding capital has allowed the company to scale quickly and use its wide footprint to partner with large capital providers, ensuring that women can aim, gain access to capital to grow their businesses, even in remote areas. The second example is in women's entrepreneurship. Um, we, we know the huge issues that women entrepreneurs face around the world, and some of those have uh, been covered today, but not just in access to financing, but also access to technology, business support, insurance, the list goes on. We conducted some research recently into ultra micro entrepreneurs in partnership with the government of Indonesia, which I can go into later. But the very, very top line findings were that women owned businesses have very different circumstances and therefore needs to male owned businesses and therefore require very different solutions. That makes it even more important for a gendered approach to product design and servicing these businesses is critical. And the final example is a bit of an announcement. Um, Everywhere I go, I talk to funders, to practitioners, and we talk about many topics, but there's always um, two areas of almost universal agreement. The first is that there is no better or more urgent time than now as we recover from the global pandemic to build more inclusive financial societies that benefit women and women entrepreneurs. The second area of 
almost violent agreement is that collective action is increasingly important if we're to be successful. For this reason, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has asked Women's World Banking and our partner UNCDF to build a women's financial inclusion advocacy hub to catalyze collective action from around the development world and focus it on the most important aspects to drive change. This hub will, we hope, include many organizations from nonprofits, civil society organizations, development banks, commercial organizations, and it's aimed at driving greater financial access for women and women entrepreneurs. It will advocate globally on platforms where the world leaders congregate, like here at the G20 and the G7, but also most importantly, locally. And the first market we're launching this collective action hub will be Indonesia next month. The second market will be in, in Ethiopia. And we hope um, that the collective effort from organizations with both a global and country focus will enable us to share best practice across our networks. And we look forward to working with Indonesian government and other partners um, for economic recovery and growth. Tara Makassi. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for sharing about Women's World Bank's engagement in supporting women's financial inclusion or digital financial inclusion. So now let's move to Afak Koman to share his insights and experience on Kopi Bali Arabic Talk in Germany, including opportunities and challenges in financing, digitalization, and expansion of MSMEs. Pakoman, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the time. I am Komang Sukarsana, uh, the owner of Bali Arabica. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Bali Arabica is one of uh, micro, small, medium enterprise supported by Indonesia in 2014. Uh, and I am focused on planting, processing, and marketing copy in Bali. We are uh, planting copy in, Kindam in Kindamani area, planted start from 900 until 1000 above sea level. And the taste specialty about the, our copy is like lemon it is and our copy is the first copy in indonesia get indication geographical certificate and we uh, work with uh, many many farmers there how to growing processing and selling copy together and we have many support from indonesian indonesian bank is like promotion marketing and also we have a lot of training how to selling the copy in e-commerce how to selling copy to the world for go export and then uh, during pandemic i was trying to change the business from offline to online. And we selling the copy in e-commerce like Tokopedia, Shopee, to change new experience. And there is, we use digital payment channel such as Curious. It's very important for me because it's quick, easy, and safety to using. And we also, Bali Arabica has another business. We calling Journey of Bali Copy. Journey of Bali Copy is one of copy experience. Special, we connected with the international e-commerce like Airbnb, Get Your Guide, Aviator, to sharing about copy experience in Kintamani. And then we use digital payment like PayPal to transaction, to transaction for the copy to service. And for the go export, we have uh, many, many support from Indonesian bank. It's like last month, I've been to London Copy Festival. Uh, and Indonesian bank provided full support 
for the promotion of international such as promotion Kintamani Kopi at the London Kopi Festival. It is very uh, amazing for me because there is, we can get uh, many op opportunity about the international copy market and then there is we can uh, testing copy, the best copy in the world and from that we also developing the copy business tourists for the both local international copy service business. And after this, we can create the product according to market needs, such as focusing on selling green bean to the roastery, and then to the copy roasted for the copy shop, cafe, restaurant, for the profit maximum. Using more uh, MSMA to sell roasted coffee bean so that farmer get better added value. Collaborate with the copy aggregator oversize to explore cooperative along with the support from Indonesian, Indonesian bank. I hope from digital I can get the best market for international or for the local to using the digital e-commerce and get more profit for our business. Thank you. Thank you, Pakuman, for sharing interest in insights from Kopi Bali Arabica Kintamani. And let's continue with Richard to share his insights based on the implementation of Tambili, a credit guarantee facility which matches SMEs seeking financing with financial institutions as an online platform. Richard, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, good evening and uh, good day to, to everyone. And my name is Richard Fink and I'm with the Middle East Investment Initiative, which is a nonprofit uh, organization that focuses exclusively on access to finance for small and uh, medium enterprises. And uh, I'm here today to share with you a digital solution for access to finance called Tamwili. So if we can go to the next uh, slide. So uh, as, as I'm sure, <laughs> Almost everyone in this audience is, is quite familiar with there are numerous challenges uh, for accessing finance. Uh, you know, MEII uh, has a lot of focus in the Middle East, North Africa region, and the issues and the challenges and the constraints that are faced by the micro, small, and medium enterprises here are pretty uh, uh, globally uh, faced uh, by MSMEs all over the world. So in, in various studies, uh, the, the key issues that keep coming up are uh, the issue of collateral, transparency, and access to financial institutions. So from the point of view of a bank, the banks are always going to, to uh, face uh, comfort or have comfort when there's collateral to back any financing. Uh, another issue that, that the banks often cite is the lack of transparency. They don't know uh, enough about this uh, SME. They, they're, they're informally uh, structured or they lack uh, financial information or there's a lack of third party information, uh, say from credit bureaus, et cetera. And, and that becomes a big problem for the financial institutions because they, they, they're harder to evaluate and thus more expensive to, to service. And there's this higher acquisition cost. From the point of view of the SMEs, or the, as well as the micro, is it's a very time intensive process to, to access financing. So one of the, the big issues is uh, you need to, to mobilize yourself, leave your place of business, go to the MFI or the bank, learn what is necessary to submit a full application. And at that point, uh, often is two or three trips before a, a dossier is, is, is fully uh, completed. Uh, also just navigating the process and understanding what are the 
write uh, financial products for you as an MSME is also daunting, especially for those accessing finance for the first time. So the solutions uh, we have for this is, is Tamwili Assist, which focuses on financial literacy and transparency of the MSME and Tamwili Platform, which is effectively a, an online platform that uh, allows an MSME to create a universal financing application that can then be viewed by the entire financial market in that country. Next slide, please. So quickly, uh, Tamwili Assist is uh, uh, the, the, the core uh, idea of this is to address an issue that most businesses face. They know accounting and financial management is important, but they continue to delay the adoption of an accounting software or mini ERP system because they're always busy dealing with customers, new orders, et cetera. So what we do is we take uh, the, the majority charge of getting them set up with a software and we accompany them for a period of up to one year. Uh, we can provide them with an intern to help them uh, through this initial start process, as well as training on how to set up KPIs, et cetera. So that is Tamwili Assist. Uh, next slide, please. And for Tamwili Platform, which is the, the, the broader uh, offering of Tamwili. Uh, uh, on Tamwili platform, you have two parties operating on the platform. You have the micro entrepreneurs or the very small enterprises or the small medium enterprises on one side who are looking for financing. And on the other side, you have the financial institutions, be it the MFIs, the banks, leasing companies, uh, equity providers, uh, et cetera. And what uh, they do is they can put their financing requests on the platform. And we have a team that validates that the business is who they say they are and the bankability. So if they pass those two tests, it is published on the platform and where the other financial institutions can express interest to further uh, discuss the financing need. I'm happy to go into more of this as we get into the, the questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for sharing interesting insights from Tom Bailey and also highlighting some important areas of access to finance by MSME. So, so now let's move to Haitam to share some insights and importance of the G20 high-level policy guidelines on digital financial inclusion for youth, women, and MSME as one of the deliverables of GPFI under the Saudi G20 presidency in 2020. Over to you, Haitam. Thank you, Paulina, and greeting everyone. It is my pleasure to speak to you today uh, to shed some light on one of the very important and very relevant outcomes of the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, which was produced during the uh, Saudi G20 presidency in 2020. Uh, I should have slides, but if there's difficulties, I can continue without them. Uh, the GBFI is an uh, inclusive, uh, there we are. The GBFI is an inclusive platform for all the G20 countries uh, and in, non interested and in, interested non G20 countries uh, and relevant stakeholders uh, to carry forward work on financial inclusion and provide leadership for the global financial inclusion community through its represent, representation in the G20 uh, finance track. Uh, that through policy de development and analysis and knowledge sharing and promoting international cooperation. Uh, despite the significant uh, progress over the past decade within the G20 to advance financial inclusion worldwide, uh, financial inclusion gap continues to persist. Uh, there are still more than 1.7 billion adults globally who do not have access to financial services. And those excluded from financial services are uh, disproportionately uh, youth and women. SMEs uh, are also an important engine of innovation and job creation, investment and economic development. And yet, access to financial uh, or finance, access to finance is uh, frequently cited as an entry and growth barrier for SMEs. 
Uh, I believe uh, we all agree that uh, advancing financial inclusion of vulnerable and underserved population is a prerequisite to unlock economic opportunities and enable inclusive and stronger development and economy, economic recovery. Uh, in 2020, under uh, the Saudi G20 presidency, the GDFI focused on harsening, uh, harsening and advancing digital financial inclusion for youth, women, and SMEs, particularly on the areas of advancing youth digital financial inclusion, empowering women through digital financial inclusion, and promoting digital and innovative SME financing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the GBFI produced in 2020 the uh, G20 high-level policy guidelines on digital financial inclusion for youth, women, and SMEs. Uh, the purpose of the high-level policy guidelines is to provide a uh, resource for governments, private sector, and international development community to identify potential policy approaches which can be taken to reduce the gaps in financial inclusion for youth, women, and SMEs. And the uh, G20 high-level policy guidelines provide an indicative and non-binding policy uh, guidance for policymakers at uh, the national level uh, aimed at uh, bridging financial inclusion gaps, reaching conditions in which all people can live, work, and thrive, uh, utilizing and sharing benefits of innovation and uh, digitalization. Uh, the G20 high-level policy guidelines are aimed at uh, informing policymakers uh, for uh, regulators and private sector across four key themes, uh, which are promoting and enabling resilient and responsible digital financial infrastructure, promoting responsible and inclusive policymaking, promoting inclusive growth uh, through enabling um, a re a regulatory framework for responsible digital uh, services, and finally promoting digital and financial literacy and capabilities. Uh, under these uh, key uh, themes, uh, there are eight high-level policy guidelines on digital financial inclusion uh, that have been identified, uh, and they are supported by uh, a range of feature policy options, which are specific for youth, women, and SMEs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the high-level policy guidelines have been informed by the important work of the supporting reports, which are specific to addressing the needs of youth, women, and SMEs. Uh, the reports provide a range of feature policy options which are specific for, uh, for each uh, groups and are used uh, as example to showcase the relevance of high-level policy guidelines to addressing the needs of youth, women, and SMEs. Uh, the reports are based on extensive desk research uh, as well as data and information gathering through stock take exercises done by our implementing uh, partners, the OECD, the World Bank, uh, the Better Than Cash Alliance, the SME Finance Forum, and the Women's World Banking. And they are all available on the gbfi.org. Thank you. Many thanks, Haitham, and to all our panelists for the introductory presentations and remarks. We would like to open for the audience for the questions now. Uh, before we move to the Q&A session, please let me invite Honorable Baba Dodi Pujibalu, the Governor of Bank of India, to provide his remarks on this important topic. Baba Dodi, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Allow me to express my appreciation to our distinguished speakers that have delivered such eye-opening presentation. I generally agree with the points made by our distinguished speakers that digital transformation is very critical in accelerating financial inclusion, economic empower empowerment of the GPFI target group, and ultimately, it will be a key driver to achieve more balanced and sustained economic growth. Our distinguished speakers have also clearly elaborated the opportunities and challenges in digital transformation, as well as the importance of technological advancements in developing financial products and services. One of the key challenges currently faced by the global policymakers is how to cover the needs of wide-ranging potential participants, especially women, youth, and MSMEs, and in terms of the implementation. It should not only be, be practical and straightforward, but also economical to those under-reserved 
underserved groups of population. G20 has formulated the high-level policy guidelines on digital financial inclusion for youth, women, and SMEs, which should be considered as the basic platform for us moving forward in this issue. We are committed and share the same goals of strengthening digital and innovative technologies to boot to boost the financial well-being of youth, women, and SMEs. Therefore, indicative, non-binding, or targeted policy guidelines should be our focus. The Saudi presidency of G20 has laid the groundwork in this matter by focusing on few key areas that I really consider really important. I will just highlight the first one, namely is to promote an enabling, resilient, and responsible digital financial infrastructure and ecosystem. We can do this through a sound regulatory framework in the payment system and consider the inclusivity of digital financial services for youth, women, and SMEs. Later, I will discuss briefly the policies that have been taken by the central banks, Bank Indonesia, to achieve this, this goal. The second one that also important to mention here is the importance to promoting financial and digital literacy as a part of our efforts to enhance the resiliency of digital financial infrastructure and ecosystem. Financial literacy is positively associated with the access to credit. Based on the OECD GPFI survey, MSMEs owners with the high levels of financial literacy have been almost twice as likely can then low financial literacy respondents to receive a positive response on their loan application. With the increased issues of the cybersecurity, expanding financial literacy in the digital area should be one of the forefront policies to protect, of course, the system, and also at the end, the whole business could running well. We should also support con consumer and data protection as a preemptive against potential cyber risk. To meet the objective of promoting inclusive growth, Bank Indonesia, the central bank, has been promoting digital financial inclusion through an end-to-end -end approach by developing a digital payment ecosystem for financial and real sectors. On the supply side, Bank Indonesia objective is to provide a reliable, fast, effective, and efficient payment system infrastructure that can facilitate financial inclusion through electronic payment programs. Currently, we are highly promoting quick response code of the Indonesian standards and Bank Indonesia fast payment as an efficient payments, efficient payments, economical and highly viable interface to support MSME's digital transaction. Quick response Indonesian standard especially has been a breakthrough and has proved itself to be an effective entry point for the MSMEs to facilitate on the board into the digital ecosystem. At the same time, quick response Indonesian standard give an opportunity to easily join a wide ranging digital platforms, especially e-commerce and also fac facilitate the provision of the MSME's financial transaction data so that it can be utilized to access financing from formal financial institution. These factors has, have been an important key support of Indonesian MSME's robustness during the period of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the demand side, Bank Indonesia has also supported the MSME's and underserved groups through various programs, especially financial education by promoting quick response initiation standard and also to ensure financial consumer protection. The central bank also continued to synergize and harmonize the policies program between ministers in, and institutions through the National Council for Financial Inclusion to accelerate the achievement of national financial inclusion target 19%, 90% in 2024. I stop here and thank you very much. Many thanks, Bapak Todi, for sharing our insights on the topic. Now we would like to move the Q&A session. 
And I would like to start with Andy. Uh, what have you learned from your recent research into ultra micro businesses in Indonesia? And why is it important to design financial products for women, women entrepreneurs, women social benefit recipients, or young women? Over to you, Andy. Oh, thank you, uh, Panima. And, and so I don't have a run. How, how long do I have? Because that's a very big question. <laughs> Oh, I see. We've got oh, there's a time on the left. OK, um, so 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 what did we learn from um, our, our um, research with micro ultra micro entrepreneurs in Indonesia first? Um, so so as you as we've heard from a number of other speakers, the um, the MSME community plays a significant role in Indonesia's economy. Uh, and a significant uh, amount of uh, those MSMEs uh, are women owned MSMEs and uh, the the Indonesian government has um, through through its investment which we saw I think in a video when we started has dispersed loans to about 5.4 million ultra micro entrepreneurs I think 95 percent of whom are women so there's there's a huge amount of investment in um, in this uh, area we looked with the partnership of the government of indonesia at uh, 1400 ultra micro entrepreneurs uh, and recently published a report that i've put a link into the chat called economic resilience and digital adoption among ultra micro entrepreneurs in indonesia and you know as i said at the start very very top line we we found that there were large disparities in the way that the male and female micro entrepreneurs uh, access to news financial services but it wasn't because of systemic reasons it was actually due to behavioral issues or ch uh, changes between men and women and um and so so we we took three very broad findings um from our research the first is um, the the huge financial vulnerability of women ultra micro entrepreneurs. Um, this probably isn't new, but it's worth re-emphasizing. Um, these businesses are particularly vulnerable to financial shocks uh, and unexpected events such as illnesses, job and income loss, injury or death to a partner. Um, and, and we saw during COVID, um, women ultra micro entrepreneurs took on an additional layer of vulnerability as they struggle to balance their business with, um, with household activities. And so um, we also found that women entrepreneurs are much less likely to have a cash buffer to cover one or two months living expenses compared to men. So there's there's two really sort of broad areas that we can look at there. I think you know whatever financing um, we provide to to women, um, it's beneficial to have uh, an insurance capability or, or at least a um, income replacement uh, insurance capability attached to any loans so that in the event of um, the business having to to stop temporarily um, women aren't sort of um, forced to give up their income if they have to sort of stop to look after elderly or sick relatives or um, pay unexpected medical bills. Um, the other area we could look at is building savings for women entrepreneurs. Um, at the moment they are saving cash um, and this is the second finding. They are saving, but much smaller amounts than men and, and much um, less regularly. And so we, we need to find a way of challenging uh, the, the women entrepreneurs to, to start to save more regularly. We've seen evidence in India um, where um, using G2P accounts uh, to encourage women to uh, to nudge them to to save more regularly, small amounts um, by giving them access to something like an overdraft facility. Um, that encourages the women in India that we've worked with to to start to save more regularly. That enables them to them to build up a credit um, footprint because they're accessing a um, an overdraft, and then that opens up a world of possibilities to enable them to access other financial products because they have that credit footprint. So not only are they building resilience by saving, they're then able to access other financial products. Um, through through the, the the virtue of the fact they're saving into their accounts and and G2P programs and, and Indonesia has an incredibly successful and one of the first digitized G2P accounts um, programs saving through that G2P program is is a highly effective way of um, of, of helping those entrepreneurs. Um, the third finding, just very very briefly. Um, 
uh, is, is how women use loans. Um, we found that the women themselves actually take out smaller loans and they use them for, for, for smaller uh, things like stock replenishment or repaying debt, whereas men take out much larger loans and use them to um, buy equipment and machinery or to rent or build retail space. So women are sort of servicing their businesses while men are looking to grow their businesses. So understanding the difference in the way that men and women consume products and their needs and desires um, is very important for service providers. So they must disaggregate their data and, and get to understand their women customers so they can offer them the right the right solutions. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, I, I would appreciate actually if uh, everyone can take around three minutes to uh, respond to the questions. <laughs> so um, I would also like to request Mark Komang now to share his views on how does your experience on using digital financial products and services to support business development towards go global and go digital? And also how does the use of digital ecosystem help improve MSME's business? So over to you, Pak Komang. Thank you. Uh, the first, before I go, uh, before, I have a very hard for the selling copy uh, because uh, I'm selling copy to offline system, to selling copy to restaurant, copy shop in Bali. But uh, during pandemic, we have uh, training onboarding from Bank Indonesia and there is we learn how to do selling copy with the new uh, opportunity with the e-commerce and from that uh, we learn and try try and now uh, I was uh, have a lot of uh, online shop in COP, Toped, Blibli, and I think it's, it's easy to selling because uh, we can selling everywhere and every time, and we also mix uh, the good partnership with the, the buyers, and also we use uh, the simple payment like Chris because uh, uh, price uh, is the connected with the the another digital bank like Shopify and then Oppo and then also connected with the another uh, payment system and also from that uh, I was try another uh, experience we calling journey of Bali copy because in Bali, we uh, have a lot of business from the tourism. And then in Bali also we have the, the best copy in Indonesia. And I will uh, make the new business connected copy with the, uh, the tourism. And then I create, I create it to collaborate with the international e-commerce. It's like Airbnb. Get Your Guide, and uh, Aviator, special for the porridge. It's the, it's the good, because we can uh, get more profit, and then I see uh, our business is growing up and better than before. And and I, I hope uh, I will uh, I will selling the our copy is the another country or the export because uh, in Bali we don't have a lot of copy but we can uh, make different about the opportunity with the copy. It's like we have the method for the different process and then different days, and it's the good for the future about the, our copy in Bali. Thank you, Baba Komang. So uh, let's continue with Richard. 
The town building solution is really interesting. And how do you attract MSMEs to go to the platform? And what happens if a business is not bankable? And also, how does town really support women and youth entrepreneurs? Over to you, Richard. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, some good questions. So uh, first, you know, one of the most important things about the Tem Wheelie platform is to, to animate it. And that's what we focus on uh, as MEII. And, you know, we, we take classical uh, marketing approaches such as billboards and radio. Uh, we also do a lot of digital marketing. And uh, in, in countries in the Middle East, North Africa, Facebook is a very important tool. A lot of businesses will use Facebook as their, uh, essentially the website of the business. And uh, by, and of course, uh, the, the penetration of a, a tool like Facebook is quite high. So you have a lot of opportunities on Facebook and other digital uh, tools uh, to, to promote the uh, Tem Wheelie. Another thing we do is, is, which is key, is we partner with the broad MSME ecosystem. So this can be the incubators, the accelerators, the chamber of commerce. It can be uh, development programs. It can be the state, uh, different state actors that are supporting entrepreneurship. So for example, in a small country like Tunisia, we've signed over 50 partnerships with the ecosystem partners. And so, we promote within uh, their networks that Tem Wheelie exists and, and, and the programs that they can uh, take advantage of. Um, and of course, we also feed back into their programs uh, through the Tem Wheelie platform because we see uh, a lot of SMEs that are in need of other services. So we match them with the services of our ecosystem partners and, and send them back. So we have a, a reciprocity, let's say, with our ecosystem partners. Another key activity to do is we, we go around the country and we meet with our ecosystem partners and put on conferences to showcase what are the different services that micro, small, medium enterprises can take advantage of, not just the Tem Wheelie offering, but also those of the ecosystem partners. And of course we do uh, webinars and other outreach. So in, in regards to the, the question of what happens when a business is not bankable, one of the, the, the main things we do is that, that reconnect back to the ecosystem. So for example, their business uh, idea is a little bit underdeveloped. We can send them uh, to the business mentoring programs that are offered by various actors in the market, or we can uh, refer them to the next intake of an incubator or accelerator that is taking place. Another uh, thing we find is sometimes the picture of the business is not clear. So uh, often we are going to, to recommend uh, the Tem Wheelie Assist program to improve their financial transparency so that they have a better understanding of what their starting point is, what their capacity to repay will be, et cetera. And in terms of of women and youth uh, entrepreneurs, what's the, uh, how does it serve uh, that segment? And uh, one of the big things we find, especially with women, is it gives them uh, a way of reaching out to the financial institutions without actually having to go to them. Um, that's to say that a lot of times women uh, have multiple uh, hats they have to wear and any time they spend away from the business, is, 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 it has a cost associated with it. So the fact that they can put their dossier online is a big plus. Another big thing we see uh, for the women is the certain biases that they face in different countries uh, that uh, if they're using the platform and it's the name of their business that appears to the financial institution on the other side, it hides their gender and they can communicate if they like via the platform. Of course, they can also go and communicate face-to-face uh, -face like you would in any other uh, banking uh, relationship. So that we've found uh, helps, helps a lot um, in, 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 in reaching uh, that. So thank you. Thank you, Richard, for sharing and some really interesting insights. 
Um, let's conclude this round of questions with high thumb. And also before that, I would also like to request our live audience to uh, post any questions if you have. So um, to high thumb, uh, on the three supporting reports to the G20 uh, high-level policy guidelines mentioned earlier, could you please talk about the opportunities and challenges of financial inclusion and digital transformation of uh, women, youth, and MSMEs? Over to you, high thumb. Thank you, Barima. Of course, uh, digital financial services, uh, when provided in a responsible way within a robust infrastructure, can contribute to increase the resilience of the financial sector and uh, the individuals. Actually, the three supporting reports uh, discuss in detail and provide facts and figures about the challenges that are facing uh, the three subgroups. But let me highlight some of those challenges here. Uh, for youth, uh, the report on advancing youth digital financial inclusion uh, mentioned uh, lower levels of uh, financial literacy uh, and lack of access to digital infrastructure, uh, in addition to the perception of need for financial services. For many young people, uh, they have the perception that they have no need for uh, financial services. As for women, uh, the report on advancing women's uh, through digital financial inclusion noted that the challenges for women are compounded by laws and norms uh, that uh, can undermine a woman's rights to participate in the labor force, control assets, establish and access funding to grow uh, formal businesses and ultimately make her own economic decisions. Compared to men, uh, women are more likely to be poor, less likely to have a job and more likely to work in the informal economy. Uh, the report uh, lists number of challenges and barriers to women digital financial inclusion. For example, women have uh, limited access to official IDs. Uh, actually, one in five uh, unbacked women globally cite uh, a lack of valid proof of uh, official ID uh, as a one or re reason they do not have uh, a bank account. Also, uh, women have lower rates of mobile uh, phone ownership. Uh, the men do. Uh, women have a uh, low rate of digital literacy and financial capability. Uh, women uh, of financial inclusion strategies, uh, and that's very important, financial inclusion strategy policies fail to consider women's uh, perspectives and needs. Uh, and finally, uh, lack of uh, sex disaggregated data to inform uh, policy. Uh, of course, data are uh, critical for tracking progress towards financial inclusion gaps and goals. Uh, understanding where uh, the gaps are and identifying which policies and program are most effective. Uh, however, in many countries, uh, there is still a lack of sex segregated data on women's financial inclusion. Uh, finally, for SME, the report in promoting digital and innovative uh, SME financing mentioned uh, some of the issues uh, are more pro predominant in those emerging markets that have less developed digital infrastructure and system in place. Uh, however, lack of uh, access to financial is a critical barrier to growth for SMEs globally. Uh, among the reason are, uh, reasons are a uh, higher cost to serve uh, SMEs, uh, information asymmetry, or the absence of traditional uh, data used by banks to assist uh, credit worthiness, lack of collateral, uh, and the burdensome documentation requirements. Uh, there are also uh, challenges uh, that constrain the full potential of digitalization to increase access to SME finance uh, and risk related to the use of digital financial products uh, that include uh, low uh, levels of financial and business literacy, uh, limited internet and connectivity and usage, uh, current regulation frameworks, uh, and cybersecurity. I'll stop here if you have any more questions. Thank you very much, Haitham. Uh, can we check with our live audience if there's any questions from you?
If no questions, uh, we have received one from the audience. Uh, perhaps uh, Haitham can respond to this one. How does policymakers manage the financial industry such that the digital innovation they make on their product take into account security aspects to avoid fraud and cyber risk for consumers, especially the underserved group who is most vulnerable to these risks due to their limited skills and financial capacity? Haitham, would you like to respond to this question? Uh, sure. Uh, this is very uh, technical and detailed uh, question, and uh, for the sake of time, and for uh, I will answer in a very general way. Uh, within the uh, uh, high-level policy guidelines, we highlighted a number of uh, uh, policy guidelines and uh, uh, policy options related to data uh, uh, privacy and also consumer protection. And uh, within that, uh, we mentioned uh, the importance. Uh, of uh, taking care of uh, the uh, risks related to uh, using of uh, usage of digital financial uh, services and products uh, such as uh, cyber security and uh, the uh, risk of uh, 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 hacks and and uh, loss of uh, uh, very sensitive information and uh, that's all uh, mentioned in details in the uh, supported documents uh, and it's across the board uh, for the youth, women, and, and SMEs as well. Thank you very much, Haitham. Uh, we have actually come to the end uh, of our panel discussion, and it was a great pleasure to moderate this session. And I would like to say thanks again to all the panelists for the informative and interesting discussion, and to the audience for your participation, and for the entire team for organizing this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our moderator and also speakers in our first panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, continue having participated in the lively discussion. And our first topic of the panel discussion, we are now entering the second topic, unlocking financial inclusion as the pathway towards economic inclusion. Now, once again, we invite you to participate in the discussion in person or online by submitting your questions, which will later on be answered by our speakers in the Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Now, for those joining us online, you may submit your questions through the chat box. Uh, please state your name, your institution, and to whom your question is addressed to, followed by your question. Now, for those here at the venue, you may raise your hand during the Q&A session, and the moderator will uh, give you time to deliver your question. Please also state your name and your institution and to whom the question is addressed to. Our moderator for the second panel discussion is the Principal Operation Officer of IFC, Regional Lead of Sustainability, Innovation, and MAF and Skill. She drives operational excellence and innovation, oversees FIG Advisory Service regional effort on climate, digital finance, microfinance, and alternative finance and skill in Asia and Pacific. Ms. Chiang Fang Fang has over 16 years experience in leading MSMEs and digital innovation in various leadership positions in IFC, uh, leading banks and international consultation firms. Now, Ms. Jiang Fangfang has joined us and her clients cover regulators, association and leading banks, non-bank financial institutions and tech platforms providing financial service in Asia. I would like to give the floor to lead the panel discussion on our second topic, Ms. Chiang Fang Fang. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen in Bali and uh, 860 distinguished guests on the line right now. So welcome to the second panel discussion today. And I'm sure you have all found the previous discussion very interesting with many rich cases straight from the industry and a lot of uh, useful and practical examples you hear from the industry practitioners. 
So now we will move uh, into our second topic, and uh, we will continue, of course, this important topic, but hear more from the policymakers and representative from the developmental financial institutions in and outside Asia. So as many of you know, increasing access to finance is always a common challenge for many countries. And according to the Global Findex, the world's most comprehensive data set on financial service access, around 1.7 billion people around the world still lack access to basic financial service. And believe it, believe it or not, Asia actually holds 50% of those population. So this is a common challenge for many, many Asia countries. Uh, as a member of the World Bank Group, as you know, financial inclusion is always one of the key objectives of IFC. And uh, globally, over the years, we have built a partnership with over 800 financial institutions to jointly promote inclusive and sustainable growth. Uh, so today, we are very happy and we have the honor to invite uh, a distinguished panel of speakers um, to jointly discuss this common challenge. And they will share their practice and knowledge to accelerate financial inclusion uh, of women, youth, MSMEs, and social benefit recipients, uh, especially taking the advantage of digital innovation in this challenging time. So um, without further ado, let me briefly introduce our panelists to you. They are Ms. Lucia Di Carlo, Head of Division for Sustainable Economic Policy and Financial System Development from German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And our second guest is Ms. Ririn uh, Kandringa, President Director of Government Investment Center, Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia. And our third guest, Mr. Ting A. Uh, EM, Senior Investment Officer, Economic Empowerment Department uh, from Islamic Development Bank. Last but not least, Mr. Ivan Kosian uh, Kotets, Country Director of International Fund for Agriculture Development. Um, so in the following 20 minutes, let's first hear from them. Each panelist will have five minutes to introduce themselves, their organization, and the work they have been doing uh, to promote financial inclusion. So now let me uh, turn to our first speaker, uh, Ms. Lucia Di Carlo. Now the floor is yours. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lucia Di Carlo. I'm presenting here the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we have been active for many, many years uh, in the area of financial system uh, cooperation and development. And I would like to elaborate now why it is important for us and what we have been doing. Financial inclusion is a catalyst for economic growth. It is featured in eight of 17 sustainable development goals. This also shows how important it is. Financial inclusion reduces poverty, improves people's resilience and the family life being. The vulnerable are the last to gain access to financial services and are often the first to lose it. This is why we really have to focus in this area. Financial inclusion is therefore a key enabler for households and small businesses and is even more important in this state of multiple crises, climate change, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine. In this context, digital financial technology holds a very important potential to achieve our goals for financial inclusion in a smart, fast and efficient way. The pandemic fostered a small digital revolution and put digital methods even more in the focus of development. It highlighted the transformative potential 
of digital services. In German cooperation, we are actively working on advancing digital financial inclusion as part of our efforts in ensuring a just transition in times of climate change. Following a feminist development policy, we put a very strong focus on enabling financial equality for women. We are committed to working together multilaterally to support financial inclusion. In addition to our active participation to the GPFI, we support the consultative group to assist the poor, the Better Than Cash Alliance and the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. This session covers initiatives promoting financial inclusions. I would like to give you a few examples how we work together with our partners. First is the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative. It supports women entrepreneurs. It scales up access to finance products and services. It builds capacity, expands networks, offers mentors, and provides opportunities to link with domestic and global markets. We are proud to be one of the first and largest contributors to this cooperation. Second, let us look to the Digi, uh, Digitans projects in Jordan. Here we cooperate with the Central Bank of Jordan to promote inclusive economic growth through digital financial services. It includes cross-border remittances for unbanked Jordans and refugees with a particular focus on women. And third, we have a Young People's Initiative. Young people play a, a large role in uh, the work conducted together with Indonesia. With the German Development Bank, KFW, and the Asian Development Bank, we promote digitalization in the Indonesia's uh, uh, financial sectors together. And we support here through our development bank, KFW, a promotional loan of 200 million euro. I look forward to discuss more in the Q&A session uh, with you. And um, I would like to continue working together with our partners and many of you in this seminar to further promote financial inclusion, especially in the digital area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucia. I think you brought up a very important topic. Financial inclusion is not just about finance, it's about inclusion. So it's critical to create an ecosystem where you can enable women as means used to get access to um, market, get access to knowledge, get access to education, and that all build up inclusive society and economy. So thank you very much for sharing with us those three very interesting examples. Uh, so with that, let me now turn to our second um, panelist, uh, Ms. Riring um, Kandaringa. Now over to you. Thank you. Thank you. In this session, allow me to share to you about the main financial yeah. and one of the innovation. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, but maybe you can get closer to the mic. Uh, as I can't hear you very clearly. I don't know how about the audience. Okay. Yes. So. Yes. Can you now try again? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. 
Excuse me, is the sound okay? Yes, I can hear you very well. Please carry on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank that's you perfect. very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry for the problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ririn. In this session, allow me to share to you about UMI financing program as one of the Indonesian government program to promote financial inclusion. To begin with, if we look at Indonesian business segmentation, the largest portion is micro businesses while small, medium, and large-scale businesses only account for less than 1%. Furthermore, in the micro-segment, majority of the micro-businesses are run by women, which account for approximately 61%. As we know, a lot of micro-businesses, especially in bottom part of micro-size, or we call it ultra micro, cannot access financial services, especially loan through banking facilities due to asymmetric information and lack of collateral. Starting 2007, government already has financing program for MSME, which is called Credit Usaha Rakyat or PUR, which is distributed mainly by banks. However, based on the data from Credit Program Information System in 2016, the size of loan for uh, micro court is approximately 14 million rupiah. Meanwhile, there are many ultra micro businesses that requires financing less than 10 million rupiah. Therefore, Ministry of Finance, in line with the di uh, direction from House of Res Res Representatives launched UMI program in 2017, which is managed by public service agency called Pusat Investasi Pemerintah. UMI program is designed to provide micro loans that can be easily and quickly accessed through non-bank financial institution. UMI program is expected to be one of the solutions for micro businesses, including women, youth, and micro startup businesses to get financial support so they can be involved in the economic activities. As I mentioned before, UMI program is delivered through participating non-bank financial institution that have closer presence and more accessible by the community. Therefore, identification process or know your customer function can be carried out properly. Non-bank financial institutions offer loan product that match the characteristic of ultra micro businesses, especially women, micro entrepreneur, that requires personal on the spot financial services, no collateral and community-based lending so that they can continue to run their businesses and pay off loan installments without leaving their family duties as women. Furthermore, the IP is conducting validation process through credit program information system to validate the citizen, citizenship data and to prevent, to prevent double financing with poor. Other than financing support, UMI program is also equipped with business assistance that is mandatory delivered by participating non-bank financial institution. It is important because micro-businesses need support and assistance to grow their business. 
from 2017 until the end of 2021, UMI program has already reached more than 5 million ultra micro businesses with a loan value of more than 18 trillion rupiah or more than 1.2 billion US dollar. Through 55 non-bank partners, UMI has reached 508 out of 514 district and city throughout Indonesia. Based on our data, it shows that 95% of UMI's recipients program are women. 91% took UMI micro loan below 5 million rupiah. Another interesting fact from five years data is that there is an increase in the number of younger debtors. Proportion of debt debtors with the age of under 30 increases from just 8% in 2017 to 18% in 2021. For this year, we aim to reach at least uh, 2 million new UMI re recipients and hopefully UMI program can further support financial inclusion program as well as economic recovery program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this is really interesting. I have learned a lot from this case and uh, I'm quite in inspired um, by the uh, example you just shared. Uh, I'm sure later in the Q&A session, we will have audience who wants to learn from you more about these cases. Um, okay, so now uh, let's move to the second um, panelist, uh, Mr. Ting A. Uh, and EM. Um, now the floor is yours, over to you, thank you. Hello. Uh, do we have Mr. Ting, uh, Senior Investment Officer from uh, Dynamic Development Bank on the line right now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Hi. Yes, we had a presentation today. Okay, so first let me begin by uh, thanking the gracious host and the moderator for the session and welcome the esteemed guests and uh, speakers along with. Um, I'm today presenting for the Islamic Development Bank and uh, showcasing some of our uh, efforts in the uh, economic inclusion space. Um, the timer began, but my presentation is not this, right there. Okay, there it is. So unlocking financial inclusion as the pathway towards economic inclusion um, from the Islamic Development Bank. Next week. So we have a brief introduction. Okay, um, since early 2000s, IDB began to improve financial inclusion and then launched the economic employment deviation, which ultimately resulted in economic inclusion. IDB sees the potential of economic employment Throughout the years, IDB has over 60 uh, uh, Sorry, excuse me, Tim, to interrupt you. Uh, but again, I think we have some maybe connection issue. Uh, we can't hear you very clearly. Can you get closer to your mic? Let me just try one thing. Yeah, does this help at all? It's much better now. Yeah, please. Perfect. Do you want me to do it? Okay, should we begin again or should I continue? Uh, I think you can just briefly cover what you mentioned earlier. So this is a very quick brief on IDB's uh, 
work and much different interventions with national inclusions and that developed in economic empowerment and poverty alleviation. Uh, over the years, IDB had over 62 interventions. My screen again. Yeah, there you go. And so the tier of uh, approved financing is $621 million and over 1.4 million jobs were created. Next, please. And, and the innovative approach for development, so I, IDB had a paradigm shift and that it changed the mindset from thinking of the underprivileged or children being burdens on their family and society to making them a potential economic factors in the value chain, so making them real business partners. Next, please. This slide just shows how you can by providing equally financial and non-financial solutions to those financially, socially, and economically excluded, and providing beyond banking solutions which change the mindset of the beneficiaries from being recipients of aid to becoming self-aligned and business partners, so economically empowered. Next, please. Okay. IDB has several models to do that. Uh, these are the four things that are to market. Basically, uh, the goal is to expand the scope of markets for women, youth, and services from village markets to provincial and national markets. Also, a partnership with a lead firm and industry, we introduced the private sector into the equation. Developing an agriculture company, this model is thought of as a venture capital type of investment at a smaller scale, and incubator developments through partnerships such as in the five zones and groups. This is just an example of developing agriculture company, a venture capital investment in agriculture dedicated to uh, for agricultural graduates. Uh, the structure is a five-year Mubarba agreement, a company established under that structure for the student, after which uh, these graduates recruit into the business and then become completely uh, uh, Beneficial outcomes and with sustainable economic empowerment, youth and capital to develop and Another example, it's just this native, it's called Abdelkhair. Dedicated to women focused solely on the very uh, excluded individuals, yeah, not the women. Uh, it is a collaboration, uh, an excellent collaboration. No, you skip the introduction. So it's an excellent developing collaboration between IDB, Ardbakhir, and Ms. Keda. Um, so the benefit is to basically empowering women, capacity development, and collaboration. Next, please. Okay. This program is one of IDB's programs. Uh, the objective was to develop approaches to designers and collaborate with partnerships in order to enhance the quality and effectiveness of the design and implementation of economic and economic operations. The outcomes are varied from technology systems, the platforms to economic and economic portals, politics, training, and advocacy. Next, please. These are just examples of the toolkits developed, uh, Islamic Empowerment Design Toolkit, Islamic Financial Implementation, and Monitoring and Evaluation. Next. So in the following slides, we can talk more about the toolkit ecosystem and how we deal with uh, the uh, running with uh, development. Um, and the idea of the IDB was to enter this on um, selecting data tools and types and developing the ecosystem. We're having the information and then to be sent to the intelligence. Uh, then that would be packaged for a healthy platform, marketplace platforms, and advocacy for platforms. So this goes on for a couple of slides, but I think we will take note of the time of that. Then after soon, we can continue this in QA. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it is quite uh, interesting to hear the success story from Islamic uh, uh, banking. And I believe that uh, uh, what you just mentioned is an excellent example how we can move from just a financial inclusion to uh, inclusive economy. I think all the 
case studies and examples you just highlighted during your session, especially about knowledge product development and the fintech ecosystem um, building. Um, I think we need more time. I'd <laughs> love to hear more story. I believe there are many things you can share later in the Q&A session with us. Uh, but for the interest of time right now, let's move to our last panelist, uh, Mr. Ivan um, from uh, uh, International Fund for Agriculture Development. So over to you, Ivan. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. It's a big pleasure to be here. I just realized that my presentation says 2020. It was not prepared two years ago. It was prepared these days. It's a mistake, sorry. Uh, the International Fund for Agricultural Development is a United Nations specialized agency in an international financial institution at the same time, working in more than 100 countries, developing countries around the world uh, to contribute to overcome uh, in a sustainable and in an uh, inclusive manner rural poverty. Can we please start? Okay. All we agree that uh, what the problem, uh, the overall problem we're talking about is, and it is that the lack of access to financial services clearly is a big bottleneck to inclusive growth. Now, I would like to highlight something here in is that out of all the financial services for people that doesn't have assets and that doesn't have access to working capital, the most important financial service is credit. And it's mainly for women, youth, and micro, small, and medium, small enterprises. Let me share uh, the rural perspective that not only because IFAD is a rural institution, but also because the biggest challenges for financial inclusion are in the rural world. Let me share the perspective from our point of view. First, earlier, uh, Ibu Menteri was saying that one of the biggest challenges for women to access credit is that they don't have assets. In, it's totally correct. And one of the main assets or the main asset in the rural world is land. And land is something to which women and youth usually don't access or have big challenges to access to compared to adult uh, men. So access to land and access to finance go together in the rural areas of every developing country. And the big challenges to access land are at the same time or are reflected in big challenges to access uh, credit. Because someone that doesn't have land is seen as someone that doesn't have productive capacity, doesn't have the possibility to produce an income and therefore is not eligible to access a credit. The second element here is about the local absence of service providers. In most rural areas, it is not possible to reach a provider of credit or of other financial services. And even if digital transformation is great and facilitates the access to many services, it's also true that it doesn't solve everything and that the physical presence of financial services providers is fundamental to, uh, to solve the issues, please. Agriculture is by definition a high risk business and discourages the credit providers to provide credit to small farmers mainly. And, and this is a, a, a big challenge also. The last one, or the almost last one, please. And uh, there is an element that is very important is, and is that for most services provide, financial services providers and credit providers mainly, there is an insufficient understanding of rural economy and in particular of smallholders agriculture. For example, season, seasonality is a fundamental element of the economic or the economy of agriculture. Because the difference between obtaining a credit in the right moment before the sowing, to say something, before the sowing period or before the, before the harvesting period or obtaining it after these periods makes all the difference. It can be, is the difference between something that is fundamental or something that is totally useless. Let's go ahead, please. So, uh, 
All we know that policies, regulation, financial products, institutions are fundamental and a part of the big picture, but I will, I'm not going to talk about them. What I want to talk is to bring here four elements from our learnings globally about what works to contribute to financial inclusion. First, bring the services to the clients. I was saying that in many cases, the lack or the absence of uh, financial services providers don't allow uh, small farmers and rural population to access uh, credit. So, programs, governments, international organizations can contribute to reduce the costs and the risks of expanding the outreach of the services providers. And uh, it can help, of course, to uh, facilitate the access to financial services. Second, reduce the client's inherent risks associated to agriculture by enhancing the production and the market skills, by uh, incorporating financial and business literacy, and by tackling the collateral issues that most of small producers have in the rural and urban areas. New capacities, as said before, fundamental for both new clients, but also for new uh, services providers, because even if they have, can have experience, they don't have experience working with smallholder farmers and a strong public and private joint action where government, private sector, services providers, smallholder farmers have fundamental roles to play. Last point, digital transformation is amazing and brings opportunities that we couldn't have imagined 20 years ago. But financial inclusion and inclusive growth goes beyond digital transformation. It needs to take into account the real economy, meaning producing, selling, harvesting, making agreements, going to the markets, improving the capacities. This is, uh, sorry for, for, for lasting more than expected. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, this is a very good because uh, rural lending and agriculture is very, very close to my heart, actually, because uh, I say as a development financial institution, we focus very much on this area as well. Uh, as all of you know, rural and rural population constitute a large portion of the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so it is critical that we do not only just create, we we'll just talk about financial inclusion, but create the market opportunity for them. Um, and that's also why we are now working with supply chain player, e-commerce player, which can help them get access to the market and gradually build up the history online so that we can make digital lending to them possible. Um, okay, so I think we have a, a, have rich discussion. Um, um, and now I think we need to move to our next more exciting session, which is our Q&A session where we can go deeper. Um, I will ask um, four pa panelists to please uh, think about one sentence you would like to leave to the audience uh, at the end of our Q&A. You can start to think about it now, um, but um, uh, we will shorten our Q&A today uh, from 30 minutes to 15 minutes. So I will give the opportunity first to the audience on the ground. Uh, I will seek our MC support there um, to say if anybody has any questions um, you want to raise to the panelists. It's a golden opportunity, please. Uh, if you have questions, raise up your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Great, please. Will you ask question, please first to briefly introduce yourself. Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for highlighting the importance of fi uh, digital transformation for more financial inclusion. But surveys show that entrepreneurs today, small entrepreneurs and big entrepreneurs are suffering financially because of the COVID-19 environment. Investing in digital transformation is not something cheap. How are we going to invite small entrepreneurs to invest in digital transformation while they are suffering financially? What is your 
solution to this challenging issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, who wants to pick this question? Let me ask around. Anybody from our panelists? Please feel free. If, if you allow me. Sure, go ahead. Given that nobody takes the floor, I will do it. <laughs> uh, it's a very important question, and I believe that puts things in perspective. In reality, maybe I am going to be not very popular, but digital transformation is a means, it's not an end, that requires a number of other elements to contribute to inclusive growth that is in reality the objective. Even financial inclusion is a mean, and not the end. So creating conditions for profitable and sustainable production or economic activities, I believe is the fundamental answer, the obvious answer somehow, you know, that can allow to enter into a number of investments that are not necessarily cheap, but that require a number of uh, new capacities, new policies and instruments also, but concrete action among different partners. So we are talking not, we cannot separate, we cannot detach uh, uh, digital transformation from the economic processes. That's my, that, that's my point of view, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think uh, uh, digital transformation, we have been often talking about this term, but what does this mean to smaller institution? Um, it's rarely discussed. Most of the time when we talk about digital transformation, it goes to banks, goes to bigger institutions. So through B2B to B2C, eventually those individuals will benefit from that transformation. Um, a lot of government have invested heavily um, in digital infrastructure over the years, and that makes digital transformation easier and uh, feasible for smaller enterprises. Um, okay, so let me, with that, let me then turn to our audience again. Do we have a second question from the audience? Uh, otherwise, um, audience on the line, please also leave your question in the chat box. Okay, so if no more people, do we have? Oh yes, great, please. Hi. Um, digital transformation, for example, in Indonesia, usually, uh, especially for SMEs, uh, we actually um, start also uh, with startups. So startups help us very much, especially for like payment, logistics, um, bookkeeping. Uh, I'm wondering if that, how, how can we actually make it more efficient, uh, you know, using uh, the, the growth of startups and also uh, the current technology because we believe that uh, the cloud computing will actually help us more. So uh, I would like to ask the panels, especially the one that has been uh, doing it globally, how can we actually uh, make it more efficient uh, and make use of this uh, growth of uh, startups and uh, fintech and also um, AI and, and so forth. Thank you so much. I think everybody loves this topic, digital transformation. <laughs> so again, the floor is yours. Anybody who wants to pick the question, please go ahead. Yeah, so is that a very challenging question? <laughs> So anybody wants to try, please. I believe your organization have done a lot on digital, on digital financial inclusion. So maybe um, you can share a little bit more, just to leverage the example you just mentioned earlier. How did you successfully 
help um, the small SMEs um, to build a partnership with maybe fintech startups to help them do better payment, logistic arrangement, bookkeeping, so on and so forth. Maybe I just can add shortly from my side. Um, we have different approaches, um, especially for this question, how to uh, leapfrog, how to innovate. And um, we have a so-called eco-entrepreneurial ecosystem approach so that we bring um, together in clusters um, enterprises uh, which are especially innovative in the digital um, part, fintechs um, and so on. And we believe that by this networking and cooperating, there will, there will be much more innovations than by single companies. So this is an approach uh, we pursue. And the second point is um, that if we are talking um, about platforms and standards and so on, it's also um, yeah, a multilateral task, uh, a task for setting standards internationally. And I think for this, um, these uh, multilateral networks are um, especially um, important. So because um, digital um, approaches can also work if we have um, common standards. Maybe these points uh, um, I'm answering your question. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, um, I feel that uh, from this is, I would say, a joint effort from both government, from uh, industry association, as well as a private sector player. I think we need to work together uh, so that we can drive a, a digital financial cohesion low down the cost. I think for small SMEs, uh, you can start from basics. You don't have to do transformation totally. And uh, you can take phased approach and invest step by step because many of those investment I think is critical, especially in during the pandemic we, where your customer will not use cash. They prefer to use contactless way to purchase or to do business with you. So I say right now, pandemic even accelerate on uh, the speed of digital financial inclusion. Um, I hope that answered the question. And so we only have four, five, a little bit more than five more minutes left. Uh, let's uh, see, I think there's one more question from the audience and we have two more questions from the chat box. So if there's no more question from the audience, which I can't see clearly, let's pick the question from the chat box. Uh, the first one I can say is, um, um, okay, so we believe that the change will always happen and we can't avoid it. For example, digitalization of the economy. What is the role of the government to control the change that occurs so that all people in the country can accept and implement those changes? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> so our government representative from government, you want to pick the question? Or anyone else? I think our audience is very good at throwing challenging questions to our panelists. <laughs> Can you just repeat the question again? I think I didn't hear it correctly. It's, uh, it's in the chat box. Uh, so basically it's from David. Um, so he said, we believe that change will always happen and it's hard for us to avoid it. Uh, for example, digitalization of the economy. So what's the role of the government to control the changes that all the people in the country can accept and implement those changes? So the role of the government. Any panelists want to pick the question? Yeah, go ahead, wants to talk. Okay, so maybe if no panelists, I would just briefly touch this topic and then we can move to the next one. I think government plays a critical role 
because um, the government is really the driving force behind any change in the country and including digitization. So we have seen that many governments have issued digitalization with digital economy strategy, five years plan, three years plan, 10 years plan. And under this overarching strategy, different government institutions and organizations work together. Some work on telecom interoperability or mobile accounts. Some work on invest in the data center. Some work on, I mean, those are basic infrastructure. Some work on financial segment. To, I mean, do credit bureau, uh, we're digitalizing the, the lending process, help a bank improve their uh, lending to the uh, underserved segment. And the uh, government from time to time also provide a lot of favorable policies and encourage bank and financial institution as well as real sector to adopt more digital uh, innovations in their organization uh, using different policies. So I think uh, a government plays a fundamental and crucial role in driving digital financial inclusion. And through the journey, uh, they will also help people gradually people in that particular country gradually accept the, all those changes through trainings, through education. Um, so the entire economy will become more digital inclusive and then which leads to inclusive economy. So, sorry, I think that's more than one sentence. <laughs> and we still have one more question from the audience. Yes, please. Um, so Ms. Park uh, Rudin Tara, the floor is yours, please. Can you hear me, Mr. Park? Okay, so I think there might be something wrong, but I hear, okay, just give me one second. Okay, so there's no more question. I hear that from the organizer. Um, we're running out of time actually, but I still remember, I would like to, you to leave at least one sentence to the audience, which you want them to remember after today's panel discussion. Oh, we have our guest on the line. So I guess um, um, this is uh, Mr. Park, uh, Rudian Tara. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my question to the panelists is, what would be the possibility for having cross-border financial inclusion? Focusing into the MSME, look at this region, the Southeast Asia countries. Indonesia itself, we have more than 60 million of cate under categories of M uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, which is more than population in some countries, even in the Southeast Asia, what do you see the possibility for cross-border financial inclusion, inclusion using the fintech platform in the region? Thank you very much. Fantastic question. I think this is a very good question. Uh, we hear from the uh, Minister of Information. So I know we're running out over <laughs> the time, but I do hope that our panelists and one of you can pick this very important question first border. Anybody want to try? Please. Hi, I'll, I'll give it a try. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, and we like these sort of uh, collaborations and connections across, across country. But these services have been around for a while now through, if you think of crowdfunding. So crowdfunding services are there on a platform, an international digital platform, and they're there available to anyone and everyone who has access the platform rather than being limited to a country, to a country. So I think this may help with cross-border uh, collaboration. Does that answer the question? Thank you, Ms. Chen. Um, I hope that, uh, I mean, the question is well answered. Um, I, I, yeah, as I can not really hear you very well, but I, I encourage you maybe leave your answer to the chat box. Um, maybe that's just a, I mean, issue from my side. But uh, again, I mean, I love this question very much. And uh, I know many governments, including Singapore Monetary Authority, have created Asia Africa Corridor, encourage MSCs from different continent, not even country, continent to uh, build up 
sales, I mean, through the e-commerce platform uh, and trading platform they build up to uh, facilitate more eco in inclusive um, uh, economy across different regions. Uh, they bring in banks, they bring in supplier buyers on that platform, um, which is quite innovative. And uh, I can only encourage more innovation like that happening across country, especially overseas e-commerce and supply chain. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, I know we don't have time to maybe give you opportunity to say this one sentence, I guess, uh, because we're getting really late here. So let me um, close today's session and uh, we encourage you to leave your one message in the chat box with the audience if you want. Um, so again, I want to thank everyone, uh, especially our distinguished panelists today, Lucia, Rurinian, uh, Zing, and even uh, we have learned a lot from you today and the efforts you have made to promote financial inclusion, especially digital financial inclusion. And we believe technology is really transforming the lives of underserved and under unserved population in Asia Pacific. Uh, still, many challenges remain, especially how to better control the risk, which we haven't tr have chance to touch today. Um, but um, uh, we believe that more will be done uh, with a joint effort from the private sector and public sector. And IFC is always here and happy to support uh, whoever needs support uh, in this journey. Um, at the end of it, I would like to also extend my sincere thanks to all, um, to the organizer in particularly and our great audience on the line and offline. Um, so to the organizer of this international seminar, especially Indonesia Minister of Finance, Bank Indonesia, GPFI and Indonesia G20 Presidency Committee for giving us this great opportunity today to discuss this important topic, financial inclusion. So thank you all. And let me now hand over uh, back to the MC. Thanks everyone. Thank you to our moderator and also all speakers in our second panel discussion today. And we believe it has been a productive evening or afternoon or morning for those of you joining us from the other part of the world with enlightening insights during the panel discussion uh, today. And we have now arrived at the closing session for our event. I would like to invite the GPFI co-chair from Bank of Italy to deliver the closing remarks. To Ms. Magda Bianco, the time is yours. Thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, first, can you hear me well? It's a real honor to be here today, so thank you for this invitation especially to my GPFI colleagues, uh, Ibu Yonita Sari and Park Adi Budiarso, and congratulations for this excellent international seminar and for having GPFI here to close it. Thank you, Minister of Finance, Governor of Bank Indonesia, Minister of Women Empowerment and Child Protection, for your very relevant speeches and for your support to GPFI, to our work, to our objectives. We are facing complex and difficult times. Digitalization is now part of our lives in general and part of the financial system specifically. It's actually transforming it. This has helped us enormously during the pandemic. It is offering huge opportunities for consumers, for micro and small and medium enterprises, new products and services more targeted to specific needs, better quality and easiness of access and use of existing ones also, in some cases also possibly reduce costs. New providers, new activities, think of the platform uh, world, uh, new ways of uh, managing some processes. Uh, think, for example, of uh, the credit worthiness evaluation. This might really generate greater inclusion. 
But we are increasingly aware that uh, to ensure that these opportunities are really for all, are really a source of inclusion for those uh, who are most vulnerable, those who were previously excluded or underserved, uh, that they are really the source of a more inclusive and hence sustainable growth uh, with a reduction of inequalities as well. Uh, well, for all this to happen, a number of conditions must be met in terms of infrastructures, in terms of effective access, uh, in terms of addressing real needs, uh, in terms of financial and digital literacy, in terms of protection. It is becoming clear, I think, that uh, there is a delicate balance between favoring innovation, accompanying innovation, and other objectives, uh, uh, among others, ensuring financial stability, ensuring protection of consumers, uh, ensuring uh, the, the productivity of micro and small enterprises. Uh, I think we have discussed today many of these conditions uh, explicitly or implicitly through many examples. We have learned uh, of a number of experiences that are actually managing to effectively balance uh, the different objectives. Um, I think we really have the opportunity to leap forward today, identify very good and innovative approaches, allow us uh, to generalize them, to use them for many other situations, defining the conditions to make the financial system really inclusive. Uh, women, youth, uh, micro and small and medium enterprises are among the groups uh, who are most vulnerable and who have been heavily hit by the pandemic. As we heard today, micro and small enterprises are core for countries' growth in all countries, but in some more than others. And I must say that Italy is one of them, actually. Uh, they typically have uh, um, stronger financial constraints. Women too find it more difficult to access finance also when they are entrepreneurs. And we heard today they need a specific approach, a gendered approach, for example, to their financing needs. Uh, but I would say this is true for most groups uh, if we want to be effective. They really need a specific approach. Um, as you heard today, GPFI, the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, prepared under the Saudi presidency the high-level policy guidelines on digital inclusion for youth, women, and SMEs, as was discussed by Haytham Albulaga today. Uh, but of course, there are other groups that need our attention, migrants, people living in rural areas, and actually we heard something about this by, by our IFAD colleague, uh, forcibly displaced people, elderly. We need to identify inclusive solutions for all of them, for these segments too. But I would say that many of the, of the solutions, of the examples that were discussed today, um, are a good starting point to think also about the other groups. As a whole, I think today's seminar represents a very good preparation for our plenary tomorrow and Friday. Uh, tomorrow and Friday, we will discuss uh, the deliverables that GPFI implementing partners are preparing for this year under the Indonesian presidency. Uh, two of them are actually related to MSMIS finance. One will be on innovative experiences, experiences of uh, uh, digital financial services, also beyond credit. And one will be on the definition of a regulatory toolkit for MSMIS financial access. Another area is related to the implementation of our high level principles for digital financial inclusion. I think both areas will benefit from today's presentation and discussion. So really thank you for having organized this seminar. I do hope that all today participants will really join our efforts to ensure that our future is more inclusive and sustainable. Thank you very much.